Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's Elastic User Group Meetup here in San Francisco. A little fact about the Elastic User Group here in San Francisco's history. We are the second oldest Elastic User Group in the world, the oldest being Amsterdam where Elastic started. Uh, we were actually formed before Elastic existed as a company. So thanks so much for coming to uh, the, our venue here. A big thank you for GitHub Who for hosting us. Isn't it a fantastic uh, venue with uh, fantastic food and drinks? Uh, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Um, also on that note, uh, GitHub search team are hiring, so make sure, please make sure that you uh, speak to them if you are uh, if you are looking for a job uh, with, within the search field. If they are an awesome company to work for, and you get to hang out here all day, so it can't be that bad, can it? On that note, anyone not heard of GitHub? No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, also, another bit of history: I started life arranging Elastic User Group in DC. And one of the speakers used to be my co-organizer. And just for the sake of humor, I've got a slide from the DC user group here with his picture on it. Let me see if I can. This is as typical as it. This stopped working, yeah? Hold on a second. There you go. You see him? <laughs> it's orange because I used to work for a company called Snagajob whose logo was orange. They used to host it, so hence the orange color, yeah? Yeah. But now we're, of course, uh, we're at GitHub, so it has to be white with a black. Logo. <laughs> Great. Um, a bit of an agenda for the evening. I'm going to introduce GitHub first, who's going to tell you about uh, GitHub. Uh, then I'm going to introduce the speakers. At the very end, we'll have questions and answers. And then after that, anyone who's uh, looking, actively looking to be recruited can put their hand up and, uh, so that anyone who's recruiting can go and find them. And if you're a recruiter who doesn't work for GitHub, you get to go last. If you want to go first, you have to host the next event. Come and see me. And on that note, please see me if you want to host the, this event at your office. And also come and see me if you want to, um, if you want to speak at this event. Uh, and on that note, how do you find me? My Twitter handle's there. But also, in case you want to talk politically incorrect things and you're not allowed to do that on your work Slack, I set up a Bay Area Slack community where you can come and talk about anything you want. So please join. It's free. It's the free account with Slack. Sorry, I'm a bit cheap. I didn't want to pay for the paid version. But you can talk about anything you want and you won't get into trouble with me, yeah? Within reason, OK? <laughs> yeah? Uh, great. Uh, without further ado, please can I give it a big round of applause to Frank Janya from GitHub, and big, please thank you for hosting tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It really it is our pleasure. Do not thank us. Thank you for coming. We are very happy to have you here, and very happy to show off this space. I've been here a very short period of time myself, and I am constantly impressed by this space. I do live in New York City. Um, so I don't get to use it a whole lot, but every time I come here, I'm really proud of the space that we have, and I'm even more proud that we get to host an event like this tonight. I know that I stand between you and the thing you're actually here to see, so I'm going to be very brief. I will ask you two questions. The first one is, uh, please raise your hand if you've ever done a search on GitHub before. Like, at least up. Good. Okay, now keep your hand up if search has always returned what you wanted it to be. Yeah, okay. So there's a lot of hard problems that we're trying to solve with search, particularly search on code and search on some of the types of entities that we're searching here. So um, GitHub is committed to making search great. And we, I can say that very specifically because they hired me and then they gave me some headcount to fill. We have three particular roles we're trying to fill. And if you see my username up there, that's my GitHub handle, also my Twitter handle. I tweeted out links to those three roles that we're trying to fill. If those are interesting to you, let us know. Either message me directly through Twitter, apply through the job links. Um, we are a company that is primarily remote. So if you live here, great, you get to enjoy this. If you live in New York City like me, you work from your home. Or if you live in Nebraska, you work from your home. It doesn't matter. Um, we're just looking for really talented people. We're a distributed team and we do that well. If you want to solve some of the search problems that we have, we want to talk to you. And I will let you get to the actual content of this meetup now. Thank you so much for coming. Great. Uh, if I wanted to know anything about Elasticsearch, be it learn it or be it need some help um, within my company to show me how to do it, the authors of this book is the people I would contact. Uh, they are awesome at 
teaching Elastica. They're also my providing you consultancy on how to do it right. And they're doing the two talks for tonight. I really uh, would prefer to leave it to them to introduce their talks because they're, they know much more than I will ever know about Elasticsearch. So without further ado, let's start with Doug. Doug Turnbull, please. Hello. What was that, John? Yeah. Good morning, Vietnam! How low? How high? Okay. I've done my voice warm ups. Oh, crap. Um, so, search. Isn't it great? Um, so, I am here to talk to you guys about something I'm excited about Elasticsearch Learning to Rank. And really, I want to share with you guys what, what Elasticsearch, how search relevance can be treated as a machine learning problem. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys feel free to, I feel like I'm on some kind of dais, dais, how do you even say that word? See, I can't even pronounce the word. Please ask me questions um, and throw things at me. I expect to be interrupted. Uh, and I may or may not have the answer to your question. And if I do not, I will forward it to John Berryman. And he is right there to answer it. So, so I am Doug Turnbull, and I wrote a book with, that's me, and that's my co-author's picture right there. Um, I wrote a book with John Berryman on relevant search a few years ago, uh, all using Elasticsearch, but all about returning results that are actually, uh, actually, relevant to what users care about. And this is really core to uh, my company I work with. It's a mission to empower search teams. We're a consulting firm. We're information retrieval practitioners. And one of the reasons we're so passionate about this is because if you look at pretty much anyone's marketing that sells any kind of search product, that sounds fairly miraculous. And I hope to convince you it's really hard um, and not easy. So. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, anyway, we are we are consultants and trainers, and we like to coach teams to do the kinds of things that we can do. And one of the things that we're really one of the things we're really excited about is um, because this stuff is so hard, getting through the veil of illusion that this is somehow going to be we turn on some machine learning magic and it just gets easier. You actually turn on machine learning magic because you get more power out of it. So I want to teach you guys how exactly that works. So, how do we fix this problem? And uh, disclaimer, these are not actually Amazon search results. Uh, there is a, if you can see very carefully, there is a seam in the, up there, and that seam is intentional. And if there's an Amazon lawyer in the room, please do not sue me. Um, so how do we fix this and this? There are actual taco dinosaurs on Amazon, which is pretty amazing. I spliced the taco dinosaur search with the, uh, now I want taco dinosaurs. Um, <clears throat> without breaking the stuff that actually works. And for those of us that work in search, we might know that there are millions of these queries that have to get fixed, and millions of queries that probably work just fine. And so this is a constant challenge that we face whenever we do any kind of search work or search relevance work. So you might ask, and many people do, why is this not just an obvious, well-solved problem? You pip install better search, and it just works, right? Why is this a struggle for so many people? And if you just list out some of the different verticals that exist out there in search, and these are three that come to mind really quickly for me, you can see that there are different challenges in each of these verticals that dictate how a given search result is gonna be ranked, whether or not it's gonna be considered a match, how you would build a UI around it, um, and how you would build an entire product around it. So e-commerce, you're matching on products, usually things like highly structured metadata. And you care, what do you care about when you search for products? Anyone, don't, you can cheat if you want. But. John, what do you care about when you look for a product? Good reviews. Oh. Price. Price. Amazon Prime or not. All of these things. Um, and there are many concerns that come up when you're ranking products. 
But if you compare that to something like health articles, health articles are a completely different kind of use case. Um, you care about the frequency of the words in the articles. You care about different parts of the article, title versus abstract. You're not necessarily caring about these things like price or are the reviews good? There's no quality. Well, there may be quality in a different sense. You care about if it's authoritative or not. Um, authoritativeness is pretty big when it comes to articles. Legal is very similar. Um, code search is a completely different animal. Code search, if you think about it, you're going to be, you may often, there's actually really good uh, blog articles from GitHub about this. You may be searching for free text and need to match code that sort of matches the kinds of things you're looking for. How do I sort a list in Python? Sort list in Python. Code. That's a completely different ranking and matching use case. So all of these different verticals, and then there are verticals within these verticals, all do completely different things. And really the challenge of search is that that little search bar has to support uh, as many unique product um, experiences as the point and click UI that we're used to, right? So huge challenge there. And you would think that academia would solve all these problems. The reality is that academia in general is tends to be focused, there, there's a pretty significant split between what I would consider industry, and I define industry as basically anything below Google or Bing on the food chain, um, and academia. <clears throat> academia these days, information retrieval wise, tends to be focused uh, pretty heavily on, uh-oh. The gods have disagreed with my slides. Google, did you hear me talking about you? <laughs> Come back, okay. Academia, um, modern day academia tends to provide a lot of the talent and a lot of the research for uh, the top of this pyramid. I like to think of search as this sort of pyramid of sophistication. You have this bottom of the pyramid that is basically, um, you know, your blog search or something. And it probably goes to the floor and into the basement for a while. And there's a lot of search that just no one really cares about and it's not worth caring about, right? And that's just not worth investing in. No one's going to spend money in. You're going to take Elastic Site Search or Argolia, and it's going to work great, right? There is a the top of the pyramid, which is your Googles and your Bings and maybe Amazon, a couple other like really elite top companies that invest tremendously in search. But there is this meaty sort of this middle class of search applications where there isn't a clear silver bullet from academia, like there might be for web search, but there's also not necessarily um, things off the shelf that you just plug in that solve all of your problems. So academia right now is, stop that. I don't know, my machine is up. Maybe it's a funky USB, let me try my other USB-C port. There we go. There's always, no. Oh. So Apple, can you invent MagSafe USB-C, please? Because I just need to hold this as close as my. Oh yeah, it's really sensitive. I think it's the port. I tried, I switched ports. Try this side. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay, thanks. If I have to, I hold the laptop up. <laughs> Say anything style if anyone gets the reference. Okay, cool. So one of the things that, one of the reasons academia isn't solving everyone's search problem is because they tend to be focused pretty heavily on web search, the top of the pyramid. The people that work in academia who are getting PhDs tend to get jobs at Google. Um, and there's a pretty strong emphasis and bias towards web search. Those of us in the middle class of this search world, it's worth investing in search, but there's not some paper that's gonna teach us how uh, event search at Eventbrite is gonna work or code search at GitHub should work. Really the things that dominate, just like every most application development is product experimentation and product um, 
the product team needs to scientifically evaluate what works for them and what doesn't work for their use cases. So there's not necessarily one silver bullet or one right way to do this stuff. But how, so despite that, there is a set of practices uh, and things that are sort of inspired by this field of information retrieval from academia that search engines are able to use. And how is that working right now? So how many people know what TFIDF is? Cool, like three quarters of the room. Um, right now there is, you know, you can take Elasticsearch off the shelf and you can plug in some data and if you search a text field, you're gonna get some scoring that looks roughly like this. Uh, you have a scoring function S and you can take a bunch of factors, three main factors, Term frequency, how many times does, document, does term occur in the document? So taco occurs three times in the document versus one time in the document. Three times probably more relevant. Document frequency, that's really interesting because it measures term specificity. So uh, Luke Skywalker is a good example of that. If you search for Luke or Skywalker, one of those terms is pretty rare and very specific to the user's intent, and that's Skywalker because it's unlikely you uh, are going to match on Skywalker and it not be Star Wars related. Luke, on the other hand, is pretty generic. And the way to measure that is Luke just occurs in a lot of documents. Its document frequency is high. And then length. A term occurring once in a tweet is going to be more important than once in a book. At some point for a book that's long enough, it just is always going to mention every word once, right? Um, Whereas a tweet, it's pretty sparse in what it actually does mention. So you can actually, and people did research over decades, and this is sort of foundational in information retrieval, to realize that, hey, you know, what actually matters when people say that something is relevant is when it, a term occurs a lot in a document, we bias towards rare terms, and we also factor in the length of the document. And that's what we have here with TFIDF, uh, TF times one over, uh, times the, uh, or sorry, TF divided by document frequency, or in other words, TF times one over document frequency. Uh, one over document frequency is no. I'm just gonna start singing until the problem is fixed. Or if it's, I feel like USB-C ports are like NES cartridges. You have to like. <laughs> okay, cool. It's like my second Gen X reference. <laughs> Well, step one, turn back, turn computer back on. I hope no one's writing down my password. It's dot, 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 dot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. So um, anyway, we multiply all these factors together, term frequency times one over document frequency times one over length, and you get a formula that is often referred to as TFIDF, in this case, it's raw TFIDF. Um, and this has been optimized to such a point that the more or less best version of TFIDF is something called BM25. Um, best matching algorithm number 25 because they tried 24 other ones and they didn't work as well. So, um, and that is just, a, the lesson there is that this is a heuristic, someone came up with it, it seemed to work best at the time and here we are. And um, that's how, things are, are scored in a search engine. Is that all we care about? Uh, of course, not really, because as I said, every product is different and everything has different considerations and factors and every domain has its own ranking situation. So there's numerical attributes. I saw that Elastic 7 has a new way of doing function score queries. Um, they moved all, our cheer, jar, all of our cheese again. Um, uh, there's things like recency, popularity, distance. Should these things factor in? Depends on the use case. 
Uh, job search is a situation, for example, where commute distance is a big deal. And that's a huge thing to go and figure out um, compared to just raw distance. That's one area. Um, there's many different text attributes that a document can have. You can have titles, you can have uh, description, reviews. All of these different text attributes have their own provenance, their own editorial controls, and the different ways that they actually matter when it comes to search. What do you consider a term match is really important. So there's a lot of work done to around stemming, synonyms, concept search. Should, uh, should, let's see, should Anakin Skywalker, no. I have to like clean the gunk out of, okay, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. I just want to play Zelda, Dad. So, it literally, like, I wonder if I keep some pressure on it. Okay, we'll just keep, we'll work with it. Uh, there are things that are concept-based, they're language translations. All of these things may or may not match. Everything in search and relevance is a rabbit hole that you can go down that may or may not matter that you could spend an entire career on personalization factors, and so many things that might be domain specific. And your job when you do this kind of relevance work is to come up with the optimum uh, ranking using all of these different factors and hope that it works out. And of course, how do we know that we have some relevance ranking that actually works out pretty well? A lot of times when you're doing this relevance work, you have something that's called a judgment list. How many people have used a judgment list before? A couple of people. So judgment list is a pretty straight, it's a straightforward thing. It's, uh, this bubble used to say, on the left used to say, and a miracle occurs because it's a really hard thing to get. Uh, but if you get it, you have a tremendous amount of power. Because a judgment list basically says, for a given keyword, uh, a document should get a specific grade. And in this case, we're saying that four means amazingly relevant and zero means horribly irrelevant. <clears throat> so for football, and I have a little comment here saying what this uh, document corresponds to. Our document 7555, which is a ball, is exactly relevant. Our yo-yo is horribly irrelevant for football. Um, and hopefully we have lots of documents graded for our, our keywords and we have lots of keywords that are graded. And so if we go and run a bunch of some solution, some algorithm we've come up with, that is gonna rank our results. We can use this information to say, okay, Rambo. Somehow we switched from football to Rambo, but for Rambo, we're doing fantastic, and for Rocky, we put a number on it and we're not doing so great. The fours are at the bottom and the zeros are at the top, and maybe vice versa for Rambo. And of course, there's a iteration we can continue to play with and tweak and tune until maybe we can finally get that Rocky result to work out and continue to improve and regression test with this data. <clears throat> now, if you, if you look at this, you might ask, well, if I have a judgment list, and it's really good, and I have lots of judgments, and I can use it to really get a good handle on how good my search is, shouldn't this be a machine learning problem? And maybe. So, what I'm gonna do now is just to introduce you guys to search as a machine learning problem by comparing it to machine learning, kinds of machine learning problems you might have been exposed to, because it's its own weird, peculiar kind of machine learning problem, and then I wanna show you sort of how Elasticsearch fits into it. So with classic machine learning, like regression or classification, our goal is to make point predictions. So we have a lot of information about something, and we need to make a prediction about that one thing. We're gonna see learning to rank is different. So a classic example that you sometimes see is, if I have a lot of information about a company, can I predict a stock price? That's a point prediction about that one specific company. So as a function of number of employees, revenue, margin, whatever else we think we might come up with <clears throat> about the business that we think is, is, is pertinent to that task. We have two judgment list slides. So in, uh, in, a lot, in learning to rank, it's not, we're not usually, it's a little bit different, we're not usually doing point prediction. 
you could do point prediction where you actually try to come up with some function that predicts the four or the three or the zero. <clears throat> what you're actually trying to do is to generate a scoring function that can do its best, the best job it can of optimizing the ordering of a group of items, which is a subtle difference. So for example, that ball, we don't care if it gets a four or a 20 or a 100. All we really care about is whatever the scoring function is, ranks it higher than Jersey, which ranks it higher than Yo-Yo. And we don't care what the score ultimately is. And then that's within that group or query. And then within another group, we have another set of considerations. So stereo, we just want that ordering to be as close as possible to the best it could be. So there's a within group aspect to, to, to learning to rank that is usually makes it different than classic machine learning. So another part, big uh, feature of, the, of machine learning is this idea of doing a test and training split. So the idea of this is that you train your model with s specific examples, and just like we would not want to show, we would want to evaluate whether or not our students are actually good at solving the problem we just trained them at, we would hold back some uh, questions to ask them at the test. Um, so smart machine learning model, can you actually predict the stock price of Apple, even though you haven't seen that during your education? Uh, and we would say, we would kind of get a sense for whether or not our, our uh, model was actually performing well on examples it hasn't seen before. Um, if it's just performing well in training data, well then it's, well, we would use the term, it's overfit to that training data. And it's not particularly useful if it, all it does is, it's like memorizing a bunch of stuff in a somewhere and um, just spitting back out answers to you. We need it to generalize past what it's seen. In search with learning to rank, we do a test and training split, but at the query level. So a little bit different, we're not doing individual judgments. We take a query and we hold it back because we want to understand, can, does the scoring function that we derive from our training data actually order things in a way that we expect it to, but given examples it hasn't seen yet, given queries it hasn't seen yet. So a little subtle difference there. So features. In machine learning, we're maybe used to this, you know, we have this stuff that we've gone and selected about our, uh, our companies that we think is gonna be pertinent to predicting the stock price. So number of employees, revenue, margin, blah, 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 and we might think of a lot of things. And we go through a process of feature selection, going and maybe picking the features, and feature engineering, so all the software engineering work that you actually have to do to go and grab those features, put them in, the, prepare them for training, um, make sure they're actually good and all that good stuff. All the plumbing that actually takes all the time. <clears throat> in learning to rank, it's a bit different. We have different kinds of features. So in learning to rank, we have, and notice how we're, we're looking at a table now as opposed to a judgment list. It's the same exact data except I don't have a document ID anymore, and I just have features. I have a query ID, one. I don't have the keywords anymore. And instead, I have information about how often how the keyword relates to the document. That's sort of embedded in each of these features. So title TFIDF is a feature here. And that's like, hey, there was a keyword here, and there was a document here, and here's how the titles TFIDF score, BM25 score, whatever you want to do is. Same thing with body and so on. And those are often called query dependent features. And then you have features that are just about the query and just about the document. So a query only feature might be how long was the query, how many terms, and that's actually can be a really important feature because it might speak to the complexity of the query. Uh, document features, things like popularity, uh, and you can tell I, when I was putting in these numbers, I just mashed the keyboard a whole lot. And that's basically what I did. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, one, two, five, yeah. Um, and notice, notice we're still grouped though. We still have this query identifier that's saying, yeah, in this, these features are relevant to this, keeping this group sorted in the right way. So that ID is still with us, even though we've lost the keywords and the document identifiers. Mm-hmm. 
You mean the, are you asking about the grades themselves? Like, yeah, so where would you even get that? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, we spent a whole afternoon talking about that today. Um, it's a very complicated topic. So usually for the purpose of learning to rank, you're getting, you're driving it through from analytics somehow, um, from your clickstream. And that can be, that can be pretty subjective because to get that, you have to make a lot of product decisions about what, if you're gonna do it based on, for example, conversions or different kinds of events, you have to make a lot of decisions on, does a click actually matter for our search? Does a click plus a dwell? Does a purchase matter? Does that mean that they really liked it for that search term? Um, and there is a whole, uh, one of the things I wanna emphasize is that search teams that really obs are obsessed about relevance spend maybe 60% of their time even focused on just evaluation. And that's actually often where the hard problems are is coming up with the judgment data. Yeah. Yeah, it's a catch-22, and there's something in in uh, in search that people talk to called about pres called presentation bias. So presentation bias is if I'm showing you crap, you're just going to click on crap, and you're only going to buy crap. And there are a lot of things people do to get around that. Um, one thing, one trick, for example, is to understand at a given. So, and all things being equal, position one might get clicked on. 40% of the time, 30% of the time, or whatever it is. And you can understand for your whole search application that position one, when an item is there, it's gonna get clicked on 30% of the time. Um, to generate good training data, so get, that being the case, one thing you might do is understand that if something's getting clicked below average for its position, it's probably not very good. Um, and there are other strategies to get more documents graded so one thing that is often really, can be really useful is to generate a high recall version of your query and put that in one of the slots. So position three, for example, which is everyone's favorite position to do this in, put like the version that's uh, ORed as opposed, and heavily stemmed. And it's just a shot in the dark and you're constantly trying to throw different and new novel search results there. So. Another strategy people use is something called interleaving, where you have different algorithms that are that you zip up together uh, as a chance to give more exposure to different documents. So, but it's a hard problem. Uh, there's no silver bullet to it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely won't. It does, this is not something that Elasticsearch just you click a button and it works. This is something that's a pretty involved process. It's not accurately, sorry. It's, not a, it's an iterative process because they don't know what they want to do to start with. Exactly, it's an iterative process. And you need some, you need a good enough, one common pattern in search relevance is, is um, I would say like layers of passes, where you start with a high recall version of a query and you continually augment it with higher and higher precision versions of the query to the point where you might have, if you're using machine learning models, you might have a model that is just re-ranking the top two results. Um, but you're taking a first pass, a second pass, a third pass, and it's actually really important before you do learning to rank that you have pretty good baseline search. And one of the thing, one of the big takeaways from this is don't do learning to rank because you want to sidestep complexity. Do it because you want to take on and get more uh, accuracy. But you understand that's an investment because you actually may need to get baseline search that's better than your baseline search to get, to build the foundation for learning to rank and so on. Yeah. Uh, oh, as a feature possibly, but more just you do need good enough search because these grades might be derived from how users behave with that search. So if you have pretty terrible search and you just jump to learning to rank, you might not have enough, you might not have good quality training data. So you might say like, oh, no one's really purchasing anything, no one's doing anything. I'm not really getting a lot of things that are graded for as like amazingly relevant. I'm getting a bunch of ones and zeros and it's hard to make much progress on that. So you might actually need to do something more manual before then.
Cool. Good questions. <clears throat> so practically speaking, and we'll see this more when we get to see the how just a little bit of how the plugin works. We have features, um, and we talked about features as potentially query dependent. Of course, Elasticsearch gives us a pretty amazing way of expressing query dependent features. No. Do, 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 do. What about my laptop? I need like one of those air blasters and like get the cruft out of my. Too much travel, too many kids with crumbs and. That's weird. It seemed to do the clicky flickery thing. There we go. Okay, so we have a templated query, and notice how feature one was our title TFIDF, and feature two is our body one. Notice how we have a way of expressing features as sort of templated queries. And that's more or less practically what you do in Elasticsearch Learning Drink. And you might ask, are there other aspects of our query that aren't just the keywords, like the current time, or lo user's location, or all kinds of metadata that's really part of the query. So the model, so this is where things that get interesting. So we have some function that takes our weights, or it takes our features, and tries to convert them to, in traditional machine learning, our example, a stock price prediction. And of course, you may have seen a linear model that's literally like weighing each factor and trying to discover the weight of each factor. Um, is this machine learning? I, I guess, um, sort of a semantic point. But the, the idea here is that we can arrive at these weights and we can decide how to weight revenue or number of employees and come up with a stock price prediction. And we usually, there are kinds of linear models that are used in search, uh, but I'm mostly gonna talk about what I think is pretty much my favorite way of doing this, which is a gradient boosting based approach. Uh, which is the Lambda Mart algorithm. So Lambda Mart, and one of the reasons I like this is because search is one of these situations that's extremely nuanced and contextual. So there are a lot of if this, then do this thing, and then score it this other way, otherwise go down this other path, and that sort of thing. And gradient boosting uh, using decision trees is a good way of pass capturing non-linearities like that. So, uh, what a gradient boosting is is an ensemble of decision trees. And we're going to see a little bit more about what that looks like in a little bit. Oops. Um, so this gradient boosting method is really good at sort of saying, you can imagine x1 here is our title TFIDF or something, x2 is some other factor. And uh, this, uh, this specific way, uh, <laughs> Someone run to the Apple store and buy me a laptop? That would be awesome. I would not complain. It is not online. I don't know if that matters. I think we're on the second adapter. I could send you the slides. Okay. Short commercial break.
right. Oh shoot. I'll request access. Hopefully we'll get the email. I thought that was public. It's all good. We're in good company, no one's leaving. They like your talk. Good. <laughs> Let me know if you want me to get you water or anything, by the way. I'll reach your email. It's S-O-F-T-I-N-I-O dot com. Listen to the sharing settings here. Is it? No. We're starting over. Okay. <clears throat> so we are not going to get into the weeds on how on gradient boosting because that is his own interesting different talk and I don't want to prevent John from speaking for any more than like another hour. So <clears throat> So um one thing when we get to models is we're gonna, that, that's different. And I talked about search as traditional machine learning, you're making point predictions, and search you're doing these uh, specific uh, group-wise ranking operations. And one thing, that, uh, one thing that occurs with that is, w one thing that's different when you get to models and you're dealing with that is there's a different kind of loss function. So in traditional machine learning, you might look at like um, sort of difference, difference, some squares, that sort of thing like that. In uh, something like search relevance, there's actually a different set of kinds of metrics you would like to use to optimize search. And there is a set of metrics that are used uh, traditionally to optimize search around the, um, that take as an input a judgment list, a set of judged search results, and gives us a number that says, okay, this stuff on the left for our search stereo, that's actually pretty terrible, because stereo is at the top, or taco dinosaur is at the top, and the stuff on the right is pretty good. So what we would want is if we were gonna train a machine learning model, we would wanna teach it to, to uh, promote solutions or ranking functions that can do the stuff on the right, where good stuff gets to the top, Oh, it's not just my laptop. I wonder if it's this cable. Oh, it might be the cable plugging in. Okay, if I hold it like this. All right. I'm gonna check it out. So if we're gonna optimize a machine learning model, we'd much rather promote things on the right. Even though these four results have the same exact search results, we want the stuff, good stuff on the top and don't really care, and we don't want when there's bad stuff on top. And so this is a different kind of, this is where we say this isn't really about making point predictions, it's about optimizing and ordering because it's really important that the first result be really exactly right. We want a four there. But if we put a uh, a bad result in the tenth result, no one's going to care. They're all not. They're not equal. We have to optimize an ordering that matters to search users, and search users have very specific expectations. So we need metrics that come up with that. And one metric that's very popular is something called discount and cumulative gain. How many people have worked with DCG or NDCG or any of those? A couple people. Um, 
And this is a metric that is pretty straightforward. There is a discount for each great for each position. In this case, position one sort of gets a weight or discount of one. Position two, who 0.63, 3.5, and that's sort of, that so on and so forth. And what we use that for is we multiply that by the grade in that position of the document from our judgment list. So if a one got in position one, then the, uh, that should probably say gain, the gain of that position is a one. And we just repeat that process. And we sum that up and we can get a DCG and then at four means over the top four results of 4.82. That's weird. Because that's how my multiplication works. And is that, add that up uh, one. I don't know. What is, uh, uh, do, do, do. I'm just glad that it's not my laptop. Okay. There, the zero is a, is a zero. Let's pretend that that math works somehow. <clears throat> In Doug math, zero multiplied by a number is sometimes 1.5. That's an axiom that I am asserting. <clears throat> and you have to decide when, I get to decide when that's true. Uh, notice in this case we have our we have the grade we have a different set of search results so we have a four before a three before a zero before a one we look go back and forth this DCG is lower this DCG is a lot higher and mostly what we did was we moved a four up to the top and a three up to the top that's good so DCG is measuring that good stuff is getting to the top and if we had fours in all of those positions our DCG would probably be something like I would just guess eight or nine. <sighs> In fact, I think Solar's laptop is not as clean as mine. Shh. Where is he? No. Whoops. No. <laughs> that would have been bad if that. So, it can, is there a way we can use this metric to? Uh, is there a way we can use this metric to construct a machine learning? Optimiz like optimization, because what we want to do is optimize so that good stuff is to the top and mediocre stuff in the middle is not particularly useful. So, yes, and this is what Lambda Mart does that's really cool. So Lambda Mart takes a set of query group judgments, a relevance metric, and there are dozens and dozens of relevance metrics that take a judgment list, graded results, and spit out a number of quality, often from zero to one. Um, that is a whole other presentation. Use this miracle that I'm going to show you called the Lambda Insight that's really cool and spits out from this grouped problem an ungrouped regression problem. And then that ungrouped regression problem, we can then solve that problem using traditional machine learning. And I'm going to show you how that works. And this is really cool. So this is the magic that, this is the cool part, the super magic one of the pieces of super magic within Lambda Mart, is what we do is we have our metric DCG, and we literally look within a query, and we try to see what happens, and we swap every item with every other item, and we look at the difference in DCG. It's a little bit more complicated than the difference. It's actually a little bit closer to like the, uh, the logistic function of the difference, but it's more or less the difference of the DCG or whatever metric you want, DCG, NDCG, ERR, there are so many metrics that you might pick that are perfect for your use case. And what happens when we swap them? We notice we swap this stereo with the Sonos sound system. Well, the lambda, the value for that uh, stereo, you know, that really is gonna have a positive, we realize that stereo being in the right position relative to the Sonos sound system is a 0.9 positive to DCG. And we realize that, relatively speaking, our Sonos sound system being in the right place is negative 0.9 to DCG. And this is something we can repeat for every group. So we might do stereo with speakers, 
uh, stereo with water bottle, notice a huge change in DCG, which pushes stereo's number up and water bottles even farther down. To the point where once we do that with every possible combination, we get this uh, notion of almost, uh, Dongle numero trace. Okay, cool. If you want to grab one of the wireless, you can go for that. that okay. Work, you know? Test, test, test. Cool. Um, and what this does is gives us, turns our grouped problem into an ungrouped problem. And it kind of gives us a sense where, um, this, what this does is creates kind of a document scoring universe where it says there is the situation stereo, there's this document stereo, and by the way, we know, we still know all the features associated between the query and the document relationship and the specific attributes of a document and specific attributes of a query, that we want a scoring algorithm to come out with this score. And of course, our really relevant stuff gets a positive score, and our really irrelevant stuff is just gonna, we know that's gonna have a really bad impact on DCG. It's gonna get a bad and negative score. Does this make sense a little bit? It just kind of blew my mind, and I didn't understand it for a good while until I drank a lot of beer. And, oh, thank you. So that, Doing that turns the, um, uh, actually I need to go back a slide. Doing this is really powerful because this turns our grouped problem of how do we optimize this list ordering into an ungrouped regression problem. So now we just need to learn, we need to take all the features associated with these. Remember there's all the document specific features and query document related features. And we just need to learn this value. And it turns out that that actually produces and optim tries to optimize for whatever metric we use to, to come up with these that we input into the Lambda MART process. Um, and it just so happens that the metric, the model people use because it's good for a mixture of structured and unstructured kinds of learning problems is gradient boosting. So all Lambda MART is is this thing plus gradient boosting and that's Lambda MART. We could turn this into a regret, any kind of other kind of regression problem that we wanted to. Just turns out that that works pretty well. I like walking around anyway. So any questions about that? Yeah. Like why they don't just take the difference itself? I don't actually know. I think some of it has to do with situations where um, I was wondering if, and I, I'm, I was wondering too if some of it had to do with the practical fact that some queries will have a lot of documents graded and some will have a few documents graded. And so for, for those situations, the queries that will have a lot of documents graded will have, will have, those documents have extremely high lambda values and other ones with very low. Whereas just if you have a small number, it's gonna like not be as significant. Yeah. So I think that scales it, as sort of scaling it from zero to one in a way. And so that was my intuition about it, but I, I could be wrong. Any other questions? Complaints, criticisms, insults. Okay. So how does this work with Elasticsearch? So to the plugin already, Elasticsearch lets us store and log queries um, as features. So we already saw that templated syntax I showed you. We can bake a model into, once we have this, uh, these features stored as Elasticsearch queries, we can ask Elasticsearch, for these documents, can you log out the feature values? Can you give me the, um, the TF-IDF score for title or body or whatever? Um, then we can use that to build what I, from a judgment list, sort of translate that to a training set with all the features. We can bake that model into Elasticsearch once it's trained. Usually these models are all trained offline. There's something called online learning track, but that's a 
not what this is. And um, once we have a model in Elasticsearch, then we can run the query DSL uh, query on it. So there, or there is a specific learning terrain query DSL query we can run that says, go find this model, look it up, and execute it on these, on the, yeah, using these features. And it will rank documents accordingly. So I'm gonna walk through what that looks like really quickly. Here is a syntax, and all of this is documented. If you look for Google Elasticsearch Learning to Rank. Um, all this is documented, but we have a way of putting uh, features into the search engine. In this case, we're just using a mustache template. Here is our title search, and we can use any Elasticsearch query DSL we want. Dude. Okay, cool. I think he's like switching between HDMI ports. That's really cool. That's pretty novel. Um, and we have another one down here that's for body search, and we might have one that pulls the popularity of a document out. We might have some, that we have some query primitives that like measure the length of the query in terms of terms and characters and that sort of thing. Get the document frequency of the query terms, other features that you might want. This is probably, in terms of the plugin, the most complicated operation that happens. It's basically a giant client-side join. Where you have all these documents in your judgment list for a query, and you say, okay, for my Rambo documents, I'm gonna send those to the search engine, and I'm gonna put all this cruft here so that I know, hey, I stored these features away somewhere, and I called them movie features. I want you to give me the value of all of the movie features for this set of documents in the search results list, and log those out. And what that spits out is documents 75, a search results list with those three documents, or however many there are, and literally the feature name and the value as part of the, uh, part of the document, the response that comes back from Elasticsearch with that document. And that is, that looks like probably the cruftiest piece of all of this that you have to sort of think about. So assume we get that and we have one and two one is our sort of TFIDF of our title, and two might be our body field, and three might be popularity. Oh, and I, what I didn't mention is that there is this very specific file format. Don't get a headache looking at this. All this is is saying Rambo gets a query ID of one, and Rocky gets a query ID of two. There's a four for query ID. You know, this is the same grade here, and then the one colon, two colon, because we wanted to do things one based um, feature values. And this is a file format that comes from uh, some of the earlier learning to ranks that systems that use support vector machines. And it's something that a lot of learning to rank tools understand. We can spit this into a tool that will train models, and there are lots of tools. There's LightGBM, there's RankLib, there's XGBoost. And RankLib is a one particular thing I use a lot just when prototyping because it tends to understand learning to rank pretty well. It's an academic search library uh, or learning to rank library with all the pros and cons of academic software development. Um, it spits out this lovely pseudo XML decision tree ensemble, which then goes and gets so once we have this model that's dumped out to a file, we can then upload it to Elasticsearch. We can give it a name, Doug's model. And we take pseudo XML and we put it in JSON because that's what we're here to do in the world. <laughs> and we take that and we can execute a query. So here's, remember, all of our features took some parameters. In this case, we're passing Rambo as the keywords. Here's the model we're executing. A model is always associated with the feature set. When we created it, we created it associated with that feature set so it knows what features to run so that it can do its thing. But of course, one big difference, one thing that is important to know about learning to rank, there's no concept of matching. Every document gets a score. So it's gonna score every document in your index, in your search engine, which is not really what you want. So you usually do a re-ranking operation. We talked about this a little bit. We have what we call like a baseline search, and you have some rescoring situation. There's, you know, this is just your Elasticsearch rescore query. 
and we're saying the top 100 use this. This is the same LTR query, but we only rescore the top 100 documents. So again, your baseline search still has to be pretty good. And you can choose how much you want to re-rank on. Um, talked a little bit about this, and I just want to close with some of these thoughts. Is that judgment lists are actually really hard to get. They're gold, but uh, sort of like with great, it requires a lot of investment to get a tremendous amount of value. So, and with this kind of stuff, the hardest problems are always upstream. There's a garbage in, garbage out factor here that you really have to factor for. And maybe because uh, you know, my bias as more of an engineer is just to let people know that when you do this work, a lot of your time isn't in the fun training models workflow. A lot of your work is in this, how do we fix this garbage in, garbage out problem because our features are terrible and our judgment lists are terrible. And they're, when we actually run the search, it looks horrible. And how do we continue to iterate and iterate and make it less garbage? So bad judgments will leave you, lead you astray. So hopefully, whatever you're using to generate judgments, it's really important. And um, I'm associated, our company is associated with a conference called Haystack. And one of the common themes at Haystack is people give learning to rank talks. And it's like learning to rank scared straight because it's uh, the honest talks about learning to rank. And, people will spend about half the talk talking about their methodology for generating judgments and training data. Um, presentation bias, we are talked about this. People are only ever gonna interact with what they see or don't see. And feature engineering takes a lot of time. So often there's upstream problems, engineering and machine learning problems that you need to solve to get this to work well. And uh, just to close, like I said, most of the hard problems are upstream. Things like model selection are less important than all of the stuff that's upstream and all the work that goes in the engineering problems to solve. Um, more accurate training data and features are the things that you really have to focus on. And But new innovations in the models can help us with our upstream problems like Maybe we could do some deep learning to learn some latent feature representations using these judgment lists. What sort of things go seem to go with good documents and not with other with and don't go with low non-relevant documents? Can we? Um, and then there's this whole field of unbiased learning to rank, which is probably next time I come to San Francisco, I'll give that talk. But there's a way. Basically, that's dealing with low confidence judgments that don't get a lot of interaction, but you still can use them in the training process. So. Did the speed run on the end? Sorry, John. That was a. Now John will spend five minutes talking about Eventbrite. <laughs> so, any questions? Yeah. How would you handle zero click? Zero click, like no one. You you have no interactions on the clear queries at all. Not really, because a zero-click query, so A, a zero-click query might be a good thing. There's something called good abandonments, so people get answers from the search results page. Um, and the other thing is, if you're getting zero clicks, even if you're getting two clicks, that's probably not enough. You, you need a fair amount of, of traffic to generate good training data for this for a given query. And so you hope that the other queries are representative enough that those queries also get an uplift. All of this stuff, by the way, one of the other lessons learned should go in an A-B test because the other theme of learning to rank in real life sli uh, um, talks is we put in an A-B test and it was worse than our manual solution and then we worked on it for a year and maybe we got it on par. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, so th there are two parts to testing, right? There's the offline testing and there's yeah. the online testing. I think it's really, A-B tests are expensive because we can't give our users uh, bad results just to get uh, you know data from them. So I think it's a trade-off between how much you can minimize your search space for A/B tests, and that's something that uh, we're not sure yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky problem, and I'm a big fan of offline testing. But to do offline testing well, it's a trade-off of getting really good 
data for your judgments and all that stuff. So, so I think we're here too. Uh, right? Bit of a long shot here, but uh, in your experience, are there any sort of domain independent features that have worked surprisingly well just in across oh, your clients? Interesting. There are themes. So um, in the research space, there's sort of like authoritative, like things like in the vein of like a uh, page rank kind of thing or a citation rank or a we, we know that this is referred to a lot and therefore it's authoritative. Um, there are specific best practices like for short snippets Term frequency doesn't matter as much. Like for book titles, no one cares if it matter if a term is mentioned twice. And then for artic articles of text or paragraphs of text, things like TFIDF are more meaningful. Um, but yeah, another theme that has come up a lot is a combination of using a learning to rank strategy like we just showed with uh, embeddings as a feature seems to be pretty powerful together because just using embeddings directly tends to give you fairly high recall and figuring out a way to decide when to use the embeddings is actually really important. Uh, what sort of embedding models have you explored that have been most successful, I guess? Um, I, usually people are just, even just trying like simple word devec things, but usually heavily curated word devec because word devec itself is almost like a search engine where you have to do a lot of engineering to get good phrases. and But um, the tricky thing is knowing, almost knowing when to fall back to that kind of thing. And there's also like, it's it's usually people like word devec because it's easy to reason about because you get to a geometric space and you can figure out relationships between the word devec embedding space and from the query side and the document side and figure out how to sort of average them into a single embedding space. There's also a lot of stuff, and GitHub actually had a really good blog article that I thought was really inspirational on this, of using embedding space from um, machine translation models, um, where they're, they're dealing with the problem of, I search for sorting in Python, and I need to return you a code snippet. And that, there are sort of seek to seek, and that sort of family of models that I think are really interesting too, so. Um, fast text is working really well. Oh, cool. Next talk. John, you've been bumped. <laughs> cool. So I'd like to introduce my co-author, John Berryman. He's, he is, um, yes, there are two. So you have a, yeah, I think he's doing like a, do both? He's doing like backup, so if it goes out, he switches. Isn't that ingenious? That is pretty smart. So uh, John was willing to volunteer, be voluntold to write a book for me. <laughs> and John and I, I think, are similar enough that it's probably hard to tell which of us wrote which chapter. The chapters with the, uh, with the Star Trek examples were yours. The chapters with yes. the fruit examples were mine. Exactly. So, but otherwise, you couldn't really tell. So I'll turn things over to John is the man of, well, I think he'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah, so I'll, I'll figure it out. Do you want to wander around the stage or do you want to stand there? Well, give me, a, give me an option. I'll do a little bit of both, maybe. Uh, I'll put this here for now. I hope that it didn't roll off. And I hope that my computer works because Doug's already used up all the good jokes for when it doesn't. So. Uh, so today I'll be talking about search logs in machine learning uh, and able, being able to use both of those things to tag your documents. It's a, kind of a neat trick that we ran across at Eventbrite, and I hope you guys can use it too. Um, it's getting a little bit late in the night with uh, some of the technical dis difficulties we had, so I'll try to make it pretty quick. Sorry. Doug, what are you doing? I was looking for my phone. Oh, you just lost your... Okay, good. Yeah, all right, take photos of me, all right? All right, so, hi, my name is John. This is my introduction. Uh, I, I got a little haircut recently, so things have been a little bit different. Uh, intro to me, I, I, I have not always been a search engineer. I started out in aerospace engineering. Uh, I realized that I liked 
the programming, I like the math. I kept those and kind of wandered away from uh, aerospace and, and got into search recommendation, search uh, technology. And obviously, I, I wrote 40% of the book. So, uh, you know, Doug's making the mad bucks on the book right now. I'm making just a piddly 40%. Um, but that is me on the cover. Um, and currently, I am a discovery engineer at Eventbrite. Uh, if you go to Eventbrite and look for something new this weekend, uh, and if it's a good result, that's mine. If it's, it's bad, then it's someone else's on my team. Um, uh, by the way, I did just uh, tweet out the slides that you're getting ready to see today. Um, my Twitter handle is my name with all the silly letters removed. Uh, so follow me, uh, look it up real quick, and uh, you can have access to these slides and, and some of the, the code samples I'm going to show later. So um, the first question is, is what is tagging and, and why would you want to do it with your own data set? And in order to build up to what that is, you need to understand kind of the background I've come through through search uh, and, and uh, what we're doing right now at Eventbrite. So uh, the first thing to think about is e-commerce search. Search, in case you haven't noticed, is ubiquitous. We use it everywhere. It is our gateway to knowledge on the internet, Google. Uh, it is the backbone to a lot of the most useful apps that we use. This is Airbnb and Expedia, right? And there's, I mean, you could, there's countless others. And it's also, even if it's not the basis for the app, it's embedded in everything. So there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's Instagram. It's everywhere. Uh, and it's no more present than in the case of e-commerce. Uh, so if you're online and you have a web page where you're trying to sell something from your inventory, much like Eventbrite is, uh, then you have situations like this. You have a page with, with the results uh, that you're trying to, to show your customers and, and get them to buy your products. There's Zappos, one of my early, uh, earlier clients, and Amazon, who sells some uh, really good books. Um, now, e-commerce um, e commerce is search. Uh, you, you, know, you can type in whatever you want. You can select filters on the side and, and, and narrow down to the, the results you're looking for. But browse is an interesting subset of all that is possible with search. With browse, you often have these kind of similar themes where, like, it's usually the left sidebar, you have a left navigation, and you've got all these facets and you're sub-selecting into, uh, you know, just, you know, slicing and dicing the data set into the, the set of information that you're looking for, your information needs. Uh, and so you might, if you're looking for uh, clothing, you might say, okay, gender, men, women, boys, girls, uh, product type, uh, shirt, shoes, something like that, all of these things are tags that you're applying to your to your documents in your index. So, so when I'm talking about tags, I'm really talking about this experience right here. It's a, it's a way of, of understanding your inventory and allowing your users to navigate through it. Now, everything I've showed you to, to this point is something that we've had with us uh, since the beginning of time, which is about 15 years ago. Um, we've had e-commerce for a long time. Uh, it's, it's, it's all been about the same experience. But the recent change that is affecting us at Eventbrite, and I'm sure it's affecting a lot of you, is uh, the move towards mobile. With mobile, we have a very different uh, user experience that we have to facilitate on behalf of our, our users. They don't want to tap out every little thing that they want to look, uh, look for. They want to be able to uh, have a very terse interaction. They want to slice and dice the data set and get right down to like, just the items they're looking for. So and what this is is basically a tag experience. So because of this, we're having this huge move of, of people from a text-based search experience to a more like browse based user experience. So when I ask what is tagging, tagging is the ability to, ability to categorize and understand your inventory. And why would you want it? It's because it is powering the dominant user interface for search uh, in you know, the e-commerce experience right now. So how can you tag your inventory? Uh, it's important to understand everything. So uh, one way that you can do it 
is you, you can hire an army of curators. Uh, and we've thought about that at Eventbrite. And it has some benefits with it. Uh, you have absolute control over the way that you describe your inventory. Uh, because you teach all these people how to, how, to, how to uniformly tag your inventory. But the problem is, that's expensive. The training is expensive, the expertise is expensive, especially when you get into very custom categories like medical expertise. You're not hiring Amazon Turk to tag your inventory, you're hiring PhDs, you're hiring MDs, you're hiring people that are very expensive. So that, that's a definite drawback. Um, another thing that you can do a lot cheaper is re require tagging on behalf of your content creators. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to this. It scales well. All the people who are providing stuff for your platform, you don't have to pay them. They tag it themselves. They know exactly what the content is. It's their content. Uh, so they can, they can, they are, who better to tag the content? But the drawback here is it's not always clear how to connect the dots with, with your content providers about what value it provides them. Uh, if they don't see an immediate benefit on their behalf, then they're just not gonna do it, and you'll be in the same spot as you started. Um, so the, the next option is to look, instead of the supply side, look to the demand side for your tags. Uh, encourage customers to tag your contents. Here is a similar benefit uh, in that who knows the content better but the people that are buying it. Uh, the people that provide the content, the, you know, the people you're sourcing stuff from in the previous bullet, uh, they might have their own different worldviews, but your users, the people buying it, uh, might be the best places to source for the tags. But there's even less likelihood that your consumers will see an immediate benefit. At Eventbrite, we're trying to work through this. It's like maybe users want to be like tastemakers and say like, you know, I'm going to go to all these cool events and there is some benefit, but that's still going to be a fairly sparse signal that we're looking for. So what do you do if nobody wants to tag your content? What if you can't afford to hire the, the army of curators? So about a year ago, an interesting observation uh, occurred. Uh, every day, millions of people are using Eventbrite search to look for things to do this week. Uh, of those people, we have approximately, in, in a month's time, we have approximately, uh, you know, somewhere over 500,000 unique, distinct queries coming to our website. But, the most common 1,000 queries accommodate about 41% of our overall search traffic. So a huge possible domain of things that you can describe, but 1,000 unique queries describes a really good portion of our uh, inventory. And if you were to look at these 1,000 most common queries, and these, these are actually taken from the top 100, just kind of sampled, they look a lot like tags, business, events, kid events, networking, Christian, free, 5K runs, back to school job fair, they look like things that we would want our curators to apply to our documents. So begs the question, can we use our log of searches to actually build a tagging model and do this for us, to take the humans out of the equation except for the humans that are using our query to begin with? I will show you, uh, and it's not clustering, so that, that'll be interesting. How do I cluster our queries? We don't quite yet. We do a little bit, that's chapter two. Uh, so can we use, can we use this logged in uh, searches to build our tagging model? I hope so, because that's the title of my talk. Search logs and machine learning. All right, so here's the approach, and here's a partial answer to your question. Um, so assume these givens. Uh, we have a search log. It's going to have what you typed in, when you typed it in, uh, assume we have a click log. We know which search you made and we know which items you clicked on. Assume we have, uh, and we're Eventbrite, we better darn well have this, uh, a list of events and all the metadata associated with it, the title, description, etc. So with those givens, uh, step one is to find the most common inquiries, 500 for this first example. Uh, they all look like tags. Step two is to find the events that people searched when people search for any of these 500 top queries, 
find the events they clicked on, and step three is to collect all the data associated with those events. And guess what? You've got a training set. The input to the training set for our model is the name field and the description field, and the output for our, our model set is the search that the person used to get there. It's actually pretty simple, right? So uh, last step is the easy step, really, is to just push the go button and train the model. So let's go ahead and dig into this. Uh, do you guys like live coding? Yes. Woo! Well, I'm a, I'm a data scientist, and we just use Jupyter Notebooks, so sorry about that. Uh, I'll push run. I should not be using R. <laughs> but I'm not going to start a holy war right now, Doug. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm going to go through this pretty fast so that you don't see mis the mistakes. Um, first off, uh, data set that we're starting with, pretty simple. Uh, the event ID you don't really care about. Here are queries, comma delimited if there's more than one query, that led to an event. And here is the title and uh, body, uh, which I think later I refer to as name and description, whatever, of the events. Uh, and so you can see, you know, someone searched for, searched for blockchain and hit the blockchain smart panels. Someone searches uh, beauty class, and I don't know what that is, but the word cosmetic is there, so I did a pretty good job. Um, all right, let's create, create a training set. Training set is pretty, uh, this cell right here, I'm just splitting up into test and training set so that we make sure that we're testing against the, the stuff that we haven't seen before and make sure it's a real uh, tagging model. Um, actually creating the input to the training model is not a terribly complex uh, process, especially for the audience tonight. Effectively, I'm using scikit-learn's TF-IDF transformation pipeline uh, to take the name field, the description field, I, uh, you do the count vectorizer, TF-IDF vectorizer, uh, that creates a sparse vector and I turn it into a dense vector uh, because that's going to be a nice, juicy input for my tensor flow model. Um, the, let's see, yep, 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 yep. Here's roughly what our training set looks like. It's not huge. We have uh, 14,442 instances. Uh, it's, it is rather wide, which is kind of interesting. Uh, I, everything you're seeing tonight is, is kind of a, a naive, quick implementation we did for uh, an experiment that was fairly successful. There's a lot of improvements, and I'll have questions afterwards while I'll ask you questions about how to make my model better. Um, one of the things interesting is it's a very wide uh, uh, vector set we have, we have right here. So 13,877 uh, features. But here's the way they look. Each row has something like 54 non-zero elements. Uh, and the non-zero elements, I just happened to collect them out for a, an example document. Uh, there's some number between zero and what's like, we got like 0. 0.6 somewhere in here. So it's you know, just somewhere in that range. Um, TFIDF vectors. The uh, tags end up being a little bit more simplistic. We don't do TFIDF because you either did come in through the search or you didn't. It didn't matter the popularity yet. Uh, and so in this example, you know, we have, we have one example that had two different queries and uh, out of the 500, 449, 500, uh, possible vocabulary terms that we could use to tag stuff with. All right, building a model, uh, I actually cheat since it takes like five minutes. Uh, I'm pulling it out of, out of a pre-existing model. But it's, it's, this is a really simplistic model, uh, and it's, uh, you, you can delete my try accept statement here. You've got the code if you uh, get the slideshow. You can delete this right here, run it. It's actually pretty resilient. You don't have any funny stuff going on. I wanted to make a really complicated, hard TensorFlow model to get my merit badge if I did something awesome, but I, I just couldn't. It was it was a simple model. The simple model worked vector uh, better, vector, um, in including stuff that I honestly thought would would have made a lot more sense. So the the model, the input vector is 
those dense uh, term vectors. The output is the dense tag vectors. Uh, we have one, one hidden layer that basically just shrinks this input size down to the output size. Uh, and another hidden layer that just just another matrix multiplication in the nonlinearity. Um, I tried to be smart and do not the sigmoid, but what's the multivariate version of the sigmoid? Softmax. I put a softmax um, activation on the output, and it performed worse than just having a bare output. I still don't know why. It's part of our questions, um, but I I went with it. All right, so run the model that we have stored. And I, how, I've been kind of mumbling through it. Is, uh, can you guys fairly well see what's going on up there? Is that too small? OK, got some nods from the back row, so hopefully that's good. Uh, so we do OK. Um, this is all on the test data set. So this is sight unseen as far as the model is concerned. Um, and around the beauty world, uh, someone searched Truth uh, searched for this with beauty, and it was tagged beauty. Uh, someone searched for leadership seminars with this leadership thingy, and we uh, we got predicted uh, art, business, mindfulness. Maybe a little bit off, but we got it's the art of mindfulness. You can at least understand uh, kind of why it went the way it, it did. This is interesting. Truth was bridal show uh, predicted as vendor vendors needed. That's because on Eventbrite uh, there are a lot of bridal shows. But people looking for jobs as a vendor will, will actually seek them out. So that's, uh, that's unexpected, but quite reasonable for our, our model. 5K run, 5K run. Uh, this is interesting. I'll come back to this later. Uh, Memorial Day events got tagged as a Memorial Day. Very close synonym. And kind of a similar thing, Comic Con got tagged as anime, which is kind of cool. Pass, right? Um, and that's neat because you don't immediately see the word anime in, in this either. Good. So jump back into the presentation real quick. We'll note that I am a lot better with my USB ports than Doug was. Um, I have two. Thank you. Man in the booth. He's gone. He has become the USB ports. Uh, okay, so this was all well and good. A lot of fun stuff here, but there's problems with it. Uh, it is naive, and so uh, we are looking to make things less naive. I'm going to show you in a second an improvement. Still a lot of room for improvement after that, though. So one of the issues that we have is th this issue with near synonym tags. It, the, the data set that you're looking at it came from around Memorial Day. Uh, it's obvious now. Um, and so among our top 500 searches, Memorial Day was in that group. M Memorial Day weekend events was also very popular. Memorial Day weekend was also very popular. These are obviously basically the same thing. So we should have some way of, of understanding that these are synonyms and clustering them to your question. Um, also, the, t the tagging vocabulary is pretty small. It's only 500 terms. Uh, and it's even really shrunk smaller because of the synonym issue that, that I just pointed out. Um, and our tagging is, is fairly sparse. We're getting like one or two tags per event. It'd be nice if we have this rich hierarchy built out per event. Uh, so let's take a stab at it. Oh, uh, so improvements. What is this slide? Uh, da, 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 da. I've got to learn from myself. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So in, in improvements, it's kind of like the reverse of the problems. Is, is We need to be able to learn about like... Uh, if, if a user has a bunch of queries in a session, then maybe maybe they're correcting themselves. So we got spelling corrections, stuff like that. Uh, a user might be refining their search or broadening their search. And all these series of, of searches is a way to understand um, kind of how to collapse these, these related terms together and, and get a more rich understanding of this tagging space. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into another notebook, and I'll show you an intermediate step that we took to cluster all these searches together. All right, document number two. So here is basically the, the fodder material 
for making, making this tagging algorithm even better. Um, we looked at all of our search sessions, and somewhere off uh, outside of this document right here, uh, we, we, we did an aggregation to find all the top searches and all the other top searches they co-occurred with in the same user session. And we have a count for each of these. So Memorial Day weekend occurred in the same session as Memorial Day weekend events, a clarification, uh, 4,976 times. Uh, job fair occurred with job fairs, interesting, just someone just changing the terms to see if it worked. Uh, car show, classic car show, you kind of get the idea. A lot of these are almost exact, but then you, uh, if you were to look through the whole list, you get things that are like generalizations, clarifications, spelling corrections, stuff that's really useful to know about. Now, a lot of these things are super popular. Um, and so kind of like document frequency is the normal, normalization of TF-IDF. Uh, we, uh, we had to introduce kind of a normalization to the data set we have here. Um, Memorial Day events. People were searching for Memorial Day events, finding way too many general events and saying, okay, let's for search for you know, electric dance music on Memorial Day weekend. And so just because Memorial Day weekend was such a popular query during this time period, we have to uh, normalize and say, uh, you know, if you're super popular, we're going to kind of give you a hit to make sure you're not artificially associated with everything that was in our, in our index. Uh, so we do that by taking the number of co-occurrences, the original edge weight, and dividing it by the number of um, basically arcs in this graph that this had. This Memorial Day weekend of, uh, events um, also was connected to 10 other queries. So that's uh, the denominator. Um, okay, so once we can condense that down, uh, we take, we're creating a matrix of how highly correlated one popular search term is with another popular search term. Memorial Day weekend events, highly correl correlated with other near synonyms, uh, but not correlated very well with Mother Day. Mother Day's, uh, Mother's Day events, which is like right after Memorial Day, is highly correlated. You get the picture, right? Um, and based on this graph, uh, we have a matrix of connections, is what that is. The, there, there are, I think in this matrix, 2,000 some odd nodes uh, 2,000 some odd nodes. Here are the weights that connect them all. We're going to use something called affinity propagation, uh, where basically every node in the graph of connections, it looks around and says, am I the boss? And it, it sees who it's connected to, and it asks them, are you the boss? And, and after an iterative uh, series of like asking neighbors, the ownership of, of, of the domain, it kind of clumps around certain words. And so uh, this is the part where I'm going to skip over some stuff about how exactly it works. It is fascinating. Uh, but uh, you end up with something like this. Uh, you end up with a lot of clusters. I think we had something like 500 clusters. Uh, the clusters say things are related and also say this thing is the, the boss of that group. Uh, so nonprofit with a space, nonprofit. Uh, without a space, gets clustered, great. A uh, bunch of Brazilian words, I'm going to have to assume that's a good job. Uh, conference, conferences, convention, expo, seminar, summit, symposium, fantastic job. They get lumped on, under the word uh, conference. Beauty nails, uh, self ridges, skin, skin care. It's always dangerous doing this because occasionally we have a very risque topic in here. And you'll notice that I'm using literally a random sample, so it's, I've been lucky so far. Uh, but it's doing a pretty good job, right? All right. Um, most of this is, is just kind of a boring post-processing of stuff so that we can use it in the next step. The end result of this entire notebook is we've taken all of the popular queries, and in this case is, is over 2,000. It's a much bigger set. And we've said, OK, for all of you guys, what do you co-occur with all the other guys? And so it's a giant matrix. Uh, and OK, for this you know, 2,000 some odd matrix, uh, we're going to collapse it. We're going to basically 
kill off a bunch of rows and say, what are the most important rows? These, these leader, the boss rows in our affinity propagation. And for you guys that are left over, how closely connect, connected are you with the other documents, the, the other uh, searches, the other tags? That's all that's left. Given this, we go to the third notebook where uh, this, this is the reiteration of the first notebook I showed you. And I'll go, go quickly through this. But basically, we're going to incorporate this collapsing behavior. Um, again, have the same data set. Here's our queries. Here's the title and description of our events. Uh, we are being a little bit more sophisticated with the weighting. So we also have, for every query that happened, we have the number of times that it happened. Uh, so that'll give us a, a little bit better understanding of how important the query was. Uh, dun, 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 takes 10 seconds, it says, so I'm going to wait for it. Dear God, I hope it finished. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so at this point, I'm still kind of processing stuff, and I'm figuring out, like, for a given document, here are the tags associated with it. I'm just doing kind of spot checks to make sure it, it looks good. In order to get this raw set of every event had these tags associated with it, collapse it down to, like, the, the boss tags, the, the affinity propagation, the, those main tags, um, if you were to think about it from a computer scientist perspective, it's this really gnarly, uh, doubly nested for loop. Uh, if you think about it like a data scientist, it's uh, you can use this cool Python at operator, which is just a matrix multiplication, and it's really fast and easy. So yay, yay linear algebra. Um, and and then we just do kind of a spot check to make sure uh, that. The stuff works. This, this is not the labels. This is just making sure that the queries get appropriately collapsed down to something that makes sense. So yoga retreat, free yoga, yoga events gets tagged as yoga. Great. Um, vendors, vendor opportunities gets tagged as vendor. Um, I have no idea what third space is, but I, I, I did look it up earlier, and it is kind of associated with the yoga people. So uh, Lululemon, those <laughs> yoga people. Um, so everything, everything's making good sense. Our collapsing algorithm is good. We just have to make sure we carry it through and the tagging algorithm works out as well. So uh, very similar process to the first set uh, of uh, first Jupyter document. Um, TFIDF, uh, we're doing something a little bit more sophisticated for the taggings uh, to, to collapse them down. Uh, it's basically the same not basically, the exact same uh, Keras TensorFlow model again, nothing, nothing sophisticated at all really. Um, and the results, I'll show you, they look pretty good. Um, so this is the Foster Love 5K and 10K Boston. It didn't say 5K run, but it does, fortunately, it picks up on 5K, it gets tagged as 5, 5K run. Um, this is interesting, someone searched for wine and it got tagged, these. 40 freaking different things. This is great. Um, are they good? Oh, well, so it's wine, but it's Afro-Caribbean Wine Fest, and so there's African-Caribbean Day Party, Memorial Day weekend events. I think it was. That might be an artifact. Interesting. Uh, reggae, uh, reggae Fest, so we do talk about Afro beats and Caribbean music. Probably good. So not bad, right? We've got a lot of the problems that we, we had uh, that we were concerned about. We're getting better. Uh, we don't have... Now, most of the documents don't have, like, you know, the, the gold standard would be a really nice uh, hierarchical set. We haven't, we haven't quite got there yet, but we're getting some really solid results right now. Um, so I found, before I found a counterexample, I'm going to go back to my presentation. There we go. Okay, so we've improved. Oh, yes, sir. So we, we added the number of times the query led to the document as part of our training set. Uh, and you will have access to, to the slides and to the, the notebooks. I've got them in a, a gist. Uh, but if you were to look back through that, uh, we use that as kind of an extra weighting factor when you do the matrix multiplication together to say if you got five searches, 
for, uh, I don't know, EDM, and you got 20 searches for electronic dance music, then this is really a strong candidate for electronic dance music and a good candidate for EDM. It just provided a little bit higher fidelity for the tags that we're getting. Okay, so are you using it for the right? Yes. Well, I think we're using it in the mapping to get to the tags, if I remember correctly. But, but obviously, it then goes into uh, the, the tags in the previous case, the output to this TensorFlow model was zeros and ones. The tags in the second case, the output is uh, zeros, but if you got a search, it's not a one, I got it or I didn't. It's like some sort of like floating value to say how important that search was as a tag. So you're, you're kind of reminding me what I did. I've, I've, I've apparently forgotten. But that, that, that was basically it. It gets rolled into the target variable. So there's some interesting things to notice about the second set. Uh, uh, there's a lot fewer of the, the, this issue with synonyms. Uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, blockchai, I'm misspelling, they get mapped down to a token, blockchain. Um, there's a lot also um, more sample data. In the, in the first set, we took the 500 most popular queries and looked at all the search sessions that involved them. In this case, we took the top 2,600 queries, because remember, we're going to collapse them down to about 500, and uh, looked at all the searches I involving any of those queries. And it turns out that 2,649 queries in whatever time range this, wa this was accounts for over half of our traffic. So we're, we're talking about a big chunk of our user behavior is, is being actually pretty well modeled here. Um, and the tags themselves are broader. Since we have more tags and less issue with these, these synonyms taking up our vocabulary space, then we can cover a lot more semantic ground with that. So all in all, uh, things are a lot better. There are some dr drawbacks that were introduced by this additional step. Uh, the kind of key one that I'm going to have to keep my eye on is, uh, is the same problem that you have with search synonyms. When the synonyms don't quite make sense, that's a problem. So like AI got rolled up with bl blockchain just because it commonly co-occurs. And you guys won't know this, but Ozio and Rosebar got uh, lapsed together. Uh, I, I had to look them up. In Washington, D.C., people look up events that are happening at Rosebar, uh, kind of a lounge. And if you don't find anything, you go to the next lounge, Ozio. So really bad example of synonyms, right? So I'm going to have at least two customers that are very upset with me. Um, OK, so we're getting ready to wrap up. And then I'll start asking you guys, smart San Francisco folk, how I can improve my work. Uh, the first thing is just talking about how uh, there's other things that we can do with this. Um, so there's a lot of applications. Once we have a good understanding of our inventory space, uh, then there's plenty of places that we can surface this in the product. Uh, you know, we're search people. This is the Elastic Search Meetup. So providing faceted e-commerce search. Uh, what we have at Eventbrite right now are organizers click categories. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If we have a, a, a set of facets that are applied to every event, no matter how engaged our organizers are, then we can, we can provide a much uh, uh, richer, faceted search experience. Um, we can also provide uh, an understanding based on how these tags interrelate. If you attend events that are tagged with you know, uh, electronic dance music, and you also uh, attend events that are uh, tagged with acid jazz, if that's still a genre, then, then we can start piecing together uh, not just you know, what our events should be tagged with, but there's like a whole space of like how these, these things are related. Um, we can better understand supply and demand, partially as a result of that. And we've already done a little bit of work with that. When our users are typing a query out, that is directly in the tag space. And we can see a popular query go up. And we can see for our tagged events using this model, we can see the demand uh, ideally rise to meet the, uh, the supply or rise to meet the, the demand. Uh, so that's kind of an ongoing uh, question that we're asking with this data. Uh, you can apply uh, better recommendations by just directly sticking these tags in, in kind of like a secondary text field for the events. 
um, search synonyms, organizer tag recommendations. There, there's just a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm sure I could, could go on a lot further with fun ideas that are derivative. So, but there's a lot of things always that we can do to, to make things better. One challenging thing is, you know, uh, two, uh, 3,000 queries accounts for 50% of our use case. 500,000 accounts for all of it. So there's a very, very, very long tail that we do care about, but it's going to be harder to reach. And so it'll be interesting about how we maybe cluster and combine some of that longer torso data, head, torso, tail. That's what Doug told me earlier. Um, so that should be interesting. Uh, the model does bias towards uh, some of the, 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 the head kite queries. Things got tagged Memorial Day because they happen to be fun around that time. So, I mean, so there's some spurious stuff that can pop up. Um, and, and you can't cover searches that are, aren't in our inventory. Remember, our training set is made by people typing in Kanye West and then clicking on Kanye West events. If we don't have any Kanye West events, then that, that doesn't enter into our vocabulary. So that's an interesting corner case that we'll have to think through. Uh, everything that I've showed you is pretty close to the production uh, setting. We've you've basically peered in the production environment with my Jupyter Notebooks. That's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, so we need to create a real pipeline for this. Uh, it's all been experimental so far. And then everything I said in the last slide, uh, I would like to build that out too. So uh, that's the bit. I do have a one minute thing I'd like to hit on the end, but uh, if, you, if you guys got any questions or recommendations for me, uh, I'd, I'd be interested. Hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm generally a fan of human in the loop and I wouldn't discount the potential power of providing recommendations to organizers to be able to get some of those, those nuances and sometimes it's just removing the friction of having to come up with the tags themselves, which is why they don't get on there. And that's a great point. One of the issues with with this uh, with this uh, work is how do you know that our tagging model is good? Uh, we create tags, but some of our some of our tags that we predict are obviously good, but weren't part of the training set. Like the the thing that was wine, but it was like Afro Caribbean. We did a great job. But there's no way to to know that. Uh, so I had uh, someone come up in this you know tell me better ideas session the last time I gave this. Uh, they, they did work similar to this for Lowe's, and they said that they put these type tags in front of their providers for the materials at Lowe's, uh, and they allowed them to auto-tag their own stuff with these recommendations, and that's a really good indicator of whether it works or not. I want to get to you soon. I think you got the mic. Yeah. So I'm wondering, have you ever considered, like, uh, created some stuff like tag to wag or something like that? Maybe to figure out, like, uh, I mean, just um, converts, just using some techniques like work to work, converts the tag into a big embedding. And uh, maybe you can find some relationship between different embeddings, tags, stuff like that. Well, I, I think, so we're, we're right at the beginning. I've showed you, like, the, the apex of our sophistication. So that should give you some indication about where we are. Uh, but the, I think a lot of this content could be useful, like fodder material for stuff like that. So if we can start to see which one of these tags co-occur, not in the same search sessions, but in the same users, then we can start to build, like potentially, like an embedding space of like, you know, this tag is closely aligned with the, these other tags. So I kind of hinted at, at that at the talk, but an embedding space approach would be a good way of tackling that. I had um, a two-part idea. Uh, tagging off what he said, um, what if you make it a requirement to have like a three tag per event that the user has to make if you want to make an event? That way you have a column that mm -hmm. has already three tags per person that is actually using it, that you can use that to feed into your model. So we're, uh, we're investigating stuff like that. Um, right. Right now, there's a lot of potential sources for input for, from us. Uh, that what I showed today is people typing searches, and mm -hmm. we're just kind of cheating and using that for tags. But as we get more sophisticated, we want to see what our organizers think about that. And I think it's uh, the visualization I have for that is something like Stack Overflow, like where you say you get, you have to provide a tag, but you can't provide more than like five or six tags. And we start to see like 
to what I said earlier, how well our organizers agree with our idea of what taxes yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. And if they disagree and, like, you know, not just don't use this, but type in something new. And put your own, yeah. And so we start to get, you know, we start to match with the, mm -hmm. the demand side understanding with the supply side understanding of, of this space. Yeah, exactly. And the other part was um, in regards to the model, have you tried um, playing around with other sort of optimizers? Because I saw you use RMS prop. I'm not that smart. <laughs> Well, um, I've, I've been playing around with a lot of like NLP stuff and like working with like, you know, generative characters and generative text. And um, I find that Adam works pretty nicely. Adam, okay. So if, in case you want to use that. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so this will probably actually cause more issues than it would solve. Um, but at least for like the, it was Osio and Rosebar, those were the names of the two places for, for like word co-occurrence. Do you ever take um, Levenstein distance into account? So well, words that co-occur, because like Memorial Day weekend versus Memorial Day, mm -hmm. um, they would be considered more similar than Osio and Rosebar? That would work for the words that are Levenstein distance similar. Uh, and, and a lot of them are. Like, so spelling corrections, that would, that would help make sure that we are being very safe and only uh, grouping together things that are uh, spelling corrections and just slight modifications. But occasionally we had some, uh, and they were kind of hidden in, in my um, my uh, notebooks there, we, we have some really good examples of, honest to goodness, synonyms. Very different words, huge Levenstein distance, di distance that are kind of like the same idea. Uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, uh, right. I, I, I know it's not an exact synonym, but th these days they're highly correlated. Uh, so Levenstein distance would be a very safe measure, but I, th I think we still want to reach out and grab the broader synonyms. Doug's got a hard question, so, okay. Yeah, so um, I, I can see how this would be really good for increasing the recall of results, like pulling back the Afro-Caribbean Wine Festival or whatever. What I'm wondering about is how you're thinking about um, using it to what, find what the best wine festivals are and not only that, find festivals or events, and maybe this is with value or without value, but is there value in finding things that are only about wine and not about like wine and anime? If I'm searching for wine, I'm like, wine and anime? I just wanted the wine snob club, so. So you're, you're getting at some of the harder aspects of a uh, faceted browse, uh, I, I think. Um, I, the, the experience that I visualize with this data set is allowing our users to come into our website and, and have uh, kind of like a Google image search of like a few months ago. I think they deprecated it. Uh, but you basically have a bunch of tags up top that says, today I'm interested in music, not business, not food, you know, top level stuff. As soon as you click this, you have a bunch of tags come out that allow you to slice and dice and get down to it. Now, the trick that you hinted at there is at some point, yeah. At one point, you're slicing chunks away. I want music, and I don't want anything else. But once you get down to like the nitty-gritty details, um, our inventory doesn't go to like the absolute minutia of possible things, you know, possible ideas. Uh, uh, so you, at, at some point, and I don't know how this is. I'm not a UI expert, U, UX expert, but you kind of want to flip and start doing like or queries to say, well, okay, you've narrowed down to a space where the, the air is kind of thin, and I'm going to say. Uh, you want anime and wine? Okay, well, I'm going to start oaring stuff together to do that. Uh, but within any, any of these matching sets, and versus or, uh, there's a notion of, of event quality for us. It's, it's still kind of rudiment, rudimentary, but everything will be organized by the best wine event to uh, the less best. You could almost imagine that TFIDF would actually work for that because if wine events are rarer than stuff, event, or if maybe actually... If, uh, what's an obscure event thing? Do goat yoga. Goat if goat yoga is a tag a and there's wine and you search for goat yoga wine, which is less ambiguous? Uh, you probably much, you probably are, it's more important for you to find goat yoga results than wine results. It's just similar to my Luke Skywalker example. Cause that's like a really specific niche and maybe you also want to drink wine with it. Ah, uh, 
and you only want things that are t- and you only want things that are talking about goat yoga and wine, the goat yoga wine and 20 other tags is less relevant than just goat yoga wine. First off, I don't want to go to a goat yoga wine event. <laughs> but if I did, that kind of makes sense. Uh, I was thinking about using the tags as pure filter, uh, filter, and then exact sort by uh, event quality. But but it's actually kind of a good point. Uh, you can kind of get to the nuances of what you were, you could boost by these kind of micro groups. That's interesting. I heard there's a good book on that stuff. And there's a good book on it. <laughs> Um, so I see that there's like a geofencing whenever someone's searching. So are you taking that into account when you're aggregating your searches? Um, that might also improve the relevance because some events might not happen like northern part of the country where some events, bit, Bitcoin related events usually happens like in San Francisco or techie places. I miss I'm, I miss something in the geofencing of the searches. Yeah, like uh, someone searching for events, then they are searching for a specific city, like San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So when you're aggregating all your data, like top 500 searches, which account for 50% uh, yeah, of your yeah. queries or more roughly, uh, do you are filtering those based on the locations also? Yeah, that's it's it's a good idea. Um, we we've got a lot of searches coming through, but there, the world's a big place with a lot of metros. Uh, so it's sometimes when you get to some of the the biggest metros, I think, are good. We can actually geobound those and say, what are the build the model for San Francisco, build the model for right. New York, London. We got a few like awesome metros, but then there's a really long tail, tail. for smaller metros. Yeah. So it, it's uh, again everything we need to upgrade our sophistication. But uh, if this becomes successful, I could see doing uh, like metro-based models for our elite kind of like highest metros. Right. Cool. That would be helpful. Maybe one more question. Back here in the back right, Seller. Oh wait, got it. I'm just. Isn't there kind of a limit to what you can infer from just a couple terms? You know, like just someone's only entering in a couple terms in a in a search bar. Like you, you know, you really kind of need to get into a browsing function or or something else without getting context from some other area, you know, from affinities or, or, you know, categories to help them drill down. I mean, goat yoga wine, I think is a really good example. Like that wouldn't even make sense to me. And if a person said it to me, and so I I would just, I kind of think that, you know, like at at getting a system to infer, you know, like a really precise result list would be pretty difficult. It it is. Um, uh, Google's amazing, right? Because so, like, uh, someone is typing a misspelled version of like uh, daughter's daycare, blah, 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 and it, it like comes up with the right answer. Uh, you can glean a, a lot of, of data from that. Uh, you find the statistical distribution of all the possible interpretations. Pick the best. Google does an amazing job with that. Much better than kind of this. We are in kind of the middle class, like Doug pointed out. Uh, for, for us, though, there, there's kind of the hard question. When someone is looking for salsa, are they looking for class? Are, looking, are they looking for fun time with friends, good to go out? And so there's a lot of the information need that, is, that, that we just don't get to know about. The way that this approach can compensate for it is that you're, uh, if, if there is sufficient number of queries for sal- salsa and sufficiently number of events clicked on with salsa, you're taking all of those hidden possibilities and averaging over them. Not perfect. You would like to introspect into the person's mind and figure out what aspect of salsa they're getting into. Maybe by following that person and having like a user profile, you can you can get a sense of what they're about. Uh, but for now, uh, the aggregate story is, is not bad. One more. And then we'll follow up with uh, some final notes. So how much is it possible that um, the goat yoga wine example, like it's, it, maybe, maybe the end goal here is I might be looking for a wine event. Oh, but look, there's goat yoga too. Like discovery of something, not finding exactly the thing you're looking for, but discovery of a domain you might be unfamiliar with, right? Maybe it's a feature that goat yoga comes up in wine in certain searches. If you're looking for a wine event and we show you goat yoga, I should be fired. If, if there, if there, so, if, if there is wine at the goat yoga, okay, right, 
So okay. that's what I'm saying. Like, there's an element to uh, Memorial Day weekend events could be anything. There is a little serendipity to it, uh, and that's kind of like the that's the one of the hardest aspects of uh, of search is like it's so easy to narrow down because computers are dumb, and but we can actually make them do that pretty well. But it's it's hard to say what is the tangential thing that might be good. Um, and, and a lot of times, the thing that the specific problem you uh, talk about is actually kind of noise. Uh, if someone is looking for a beer brewing class, then we don't want to show them a business uh, meet and greet that happens to have beverages available. So finding that line is nigh unto impossible. It's just super hard. Actually, um, so one other comment on this, I mean, you're using popularity as uh, the key factor, but mm -hmm. just to riff off of what uh, that gentleman was saying, I mean, you got to think about seasonality and trends, and there are other aspects to it in addition to supply side, like uh, what are the trending events uh, mm -hmm. that people are creating, and what are people actually searching for in mm -hmm. summer versus maybe wine festival is something that usually happens in summer as compared to you know mm -hmm. winters, maybe not in uh, the Bay Area where it happens uh, you know all days of the year, but you know maybe in New York it doesn't happen in, in the winter, right? right? So I don't know, so things like that. So you have to account for like forecasting models uh, and things like that. Uh, maybe that's something to look at. Yeah, uh, I, and everything we do right now is assuming time is constant, which is obviously not, so. I think it's also important to remember that this is a two-sided equation, that as you promote more tags, your users are going to change their behavior based upon those tags. Mm -hmm. And if you think about like, just hashtags, for example, they started off as like, oh, here's a quick summary of what I'm saying. Um, and it turns into how do I leverage that to get broader reach mm -hmm. and use hashtags that may not be semantic related at all or for any reason whatsoever, just to you know leverage whatever system that exists. So it's like going to, to go Yoga Wine, like it's entirely reasonable that somebody's like, hey, I can create a unique event that people may be interested in by combining two different things and you know, using the marketing power behind that. So it, it's not just like, hey, searches are going to generate the definitive result. As you promote it more, I think the set's gonna inherently change. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the case too. So we're gonna have to be really careful about, it kind of, for, for me, it probably gets back to the, the user experience of like, it's easy to slice and dice the data until we get to this kind of sparse set. Uh, and so how are users going to interact with it and when do we need to start like oaring together some of these like leaf terms. And before uh, some people are leaving, I wanna do one quick follow up and a shout out for some fun stuff that's going on. I did just share my talk, uh, there it is. Um, once you get these slide notes, the link to this document, uh, these are all links you can click through to my first, second, third, fourth implementation there. Um, this is a Nashville group that you don't care about, but this is a group that you might care, care about. It's kind of, uh, it's been kind of my, my fun project for the past two years. Uh, I, I said the wrong thing and for the wrong person, I, and I was assigned to build a mentoring, mentorship pro, uh, group in Nashville. Uh, I ended up uh, talking with a very well-respected mentorship group in Chicago and found out that everything that they were doing I hated and I did the opposite. Uh, and what it has become is basically a peer-to-peer -peer learning community called Penny University. It's a reference to old Oxford uh, coffee shops. The idea is you can be a mentor today, I can be your mentor tomorrow, we've all got things to learn. It doesn't have to be a long thing where we hold hands, I'm not in some sort of elite mentor dude. Uh, but if you want something, if you want to learn something from me, reach out to me, we'll, we'll connect on uh, Facebook, GitHub, uh, uh, Google Hangouts, uh, whatever, and uh, and we can learn from each other. So that that's pennyuniversity.org. We have horrible uh, SEO, so pennyuniversity.org or click that link. And that's it for me. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Great. Um, I've been to a lot of meetups in my time and uh, arranged a lot of them too. Can I say just this, tonight is one of the best ones I've ever been to, and, and it's thanks to the two great speakers we had in, Doug and uh, John. Seriously, thanks a lot for coming all the way to the Bay Area and give this talk. They are from out of town. And also, big thank you for everyone at GitHub for such a, the, for, for such a, uh, such a great show. Uh, 
please, if you're looking for a job within this field, come and speak to GitHub right here. Uh, if, if you can make yourself obvious, wave, stand, that they, they can come and find you. <laughs> and uh, please, if you're looking to do a talk at a, venue, at, at a future Elastic Meetup, please see me as I would love to arrange it. Other than that, there's still some food left, I believe. Please network until they throw us out. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.